So a few years ago, I was going to enter the operating theater, and this was to receive titanium implants to fix a condition I was having. And of course, it was a daunting process, but it was because of this I first became interested in science, how these doctors, surgeons, researchers could come together and collaborate to create these incredible devices that improve our quality of life on a daily basis. And the notion that with science, you could be on the cutting edge and help people at the same time was fascinating. And so that's when I fell in love with science. But until relatively recently, I wasn't able to get involved with my own scientific research projects because of the nature of academia. Because sport is great. With sport, you can play it at school. You can do it at your local sports club. The facilities required for you to, to play most sports are readily accessible to most people. But with science, you need specialist equipment, specialist facilities, specialist resources. And those sorts of things aren't available to us as students. And it was this notion that deterred me at first until I fractured my pelvis. So a few years ago, I was playing cricket. And, and then long story short, I, I fell down and fractured my pelvis. And I used to play a lot of squash. And this fractured pelvis was, was annoying. It was something I would rather have not been going through. But what it did mean that was that I had this ample amount of free time on my hands to do whatever I liked with it. And I thought it was the brilliant opportunity to explore my other interests and the other things that fascinated me. And scientific research was one of them. But before this point, I had never actually been at the helm of my own research project. I mean, I'd done experiments at school. I'd done the, you know, the classic baking soda volcano experiment. <laughs> but I'd never actually done a, a novel experiment in which I was I was the one leading the experimentation process. So my first project was on chelation therapy. And the results of that project was what I wanted it to be. It, it did what I'd set out to do. But it was during this that I realized science in the real world is so much more different to what we learn at school. Because at school, we're given facts, statistics, figures. We're, we're given experimental procedures to memorize. But we're not told about why these scientists got interested in what they were doing. We're not told why they became interested in their field of research. And yes, science is about finding answers and solutions to the problems that face us every day. But to get those answers and to find those solutions, you need to have asked the questions in the first place. And we're not told how to, how to go about starting our own research project. And with all this free time, I thought, why not? And I wanted to explore Alzheimer's disease this time. It affects over 47 million people worldwide. And it's become increasingly prevalent because now that we have better treatments for cancer, diabetes, HIV, people are living longer, which is great. That's what we want. But it also means that as we have a growing aging population, the number of people who are going to be affected by dementia is inevitably going to increase. And this disease is notorious for the fact that there exists no drugs to stop or even slow down the progression of this disease. But as with any disease, an early diagnosis is essential to ensure that the patient has a better prognosis. And even though no drugs may exist right now, it means that families can prepare for the future. It means that drugs that relieve symptoms can be used for better effect. But it also means that if anything is developed in the future, if, if new therapeutics and, and, other, and other treatments are developed in the future, they can be used to better effect. And at the end of my project, I got this bispecific antibody conjugated to a quantum dot. And I didn't wake up one day thinking to myself, you know what, I'd like to create a bispecific antibody conjugated to a quantum dot. <laughs> it, it's not the sort of thing that crosses your mind every day. But after reading articles, uh, papers, journals, I, I drew inspiration from existing ideas. I, I thought of adding some other elements and modifying certain bits. And I'd got this concept. And my school, you know, as great as it is, it doesn't have antibodies just lying around for us to use. This is not the sort of thing you'd find at a school. So I would need to enlist the help of a research lab and institution. And this was frustrating because I got rejected by a large number of universities. I emailed 54 before I got one positive response. Some people didn't reply. Some people said no. Other people said no, but they broke it to me gently. And it, it was frustrating. But I, I had that one contact. And six months down the line, after health and safety and, and all that stuff, I was able to do the experiments I wanted, albeit under restricted guidelines. But that was enough to get started. And I said it was frustrating. But with hindsight, it does seem fairly reasonable. Because you know, as you get a 15-year-old asking for access to toxic chemicals and expensive equipment, that tends to make people uneasy. Because <laughs> as teenagers, we don't have the best reputation for safety. <laughs> but then throughout the project, I was focusing on one protein, amyloid beta oligomers. And I think this protein is great. There are other, other people might disagree. But, but, um, but this protein 
is present up to 10 years before symptoms first, first start to show. And research has suggested that. But what's great about this is we now think this is the most toxic form of that protein. So if you're able to, to get that protein, you have a massive head start when it comes to treating the disease or treating the patient. But that one protein is part of a family of proteins. And it's very difficult to differentiate between that particular protein and other members of the amyloid family. So the large proportion of my research was designing and synthesizing an antibody that was just specific to those oligomers. And, and, and it worked. But if you want to treat a disease related to the brain, it has to actually get into the brain for it to work. And the thing stopping a lot of therapeutics from doing this is the blood-brain barrier. So when we have a cold or when, we're, when we have some common illness, the reason our brain isn't affected is because that barrier stops pathogens and toxins from getting through. And that's highly protective. It's great. But if something does go wrong with the brain, that same barrier stops a lot of therapeutics and diagnostics from getting through. But using a method called receptor-mediated transcytosis, it's also known as the Trojan horse method, I was able to, to find a mechanism that allows drugs to enter the brain. And this is through another antibody. So say you have the barrier and you have a target protein at one end of the barrier. If you get an antibody that binds weakly to that target protein, it binds, crosses the barrier. But because it's bound weakly, it's let go on the other side. And after getting an antibody that was able to do that, and antibodies of different structures that allow them different affinities, I now had two antibodies with one target each. But I needed one antibody with both their characteristics. So then the next step was to break these two separate antibodies down into smaller, uh, smaller fragments. And I'd got the bispecific antibody. But now I needed a way to see the antibody. And this is where the quantum dot comes in. They're nanoparticles, but I designed them so that they emit light in the near-infrared region. But they also show up on an MRI scan because I added a shell of gadolinium to them. That means you have two ways. One, the near-infrared uh, imaging technique isn't as great as the MRI technique. But now you have essentially you have two ways of imaging that antibody bound to the protein. But the most interesting part of my project was something I wasn't expecting in the first place. And that was potential therapeutic properties. So these oligomers, they aggregate to form these bigger structures. But when bound to the antibody, these oligomers wouldn't aggregate. But also, they wouldn't enter cells. And if you don't have any toxic protein in your cells, the cells are going to live longer. And I was incredibly fortunate to have come by these, these results because I was so close to ignoring them. They presented themselves as a flaw in my experiment. I was trying to determine one of the diagnostic properties of, of the drug. And something was interfering with those results. And I, I, was, I, was, I was almost going to throw away that experiment and start again and try do it correctly this time. But instead of doing that, I looked at what was going wrong. And after further research into what was causing that interference, I was able to come across these properties. And the potential it has is, is great, because not only does it show diagnostic properties, you have simultaneous therapeutic properties. And I entered competitions, and, and, I, and I won a prize, which is always nice. Um, <laughs> But to have started a research project, I did have to fracture my pelvis to actually you know, get into it. But that goes without saying, you don't have to fracture your pelvis to start a research project. There are a lot of easier ways to do it. But I had to face a lot of rejection, a lot of people saying no. And I think that's what was incredibly annoying. And that's what makes us as students feel disenfranchised from scientific research. We view science as something you need a PhD in or x numbers of years of experience with to be good at. But you don't, because science is simply a system of asking questions and trying to find answers through experimentation. And whilst a PhD is always good, you don't have to have a PhD to be, to be good at science. That ability to question is present throughout each and every one of us, even from an early age. You know, as, as young children, we're always questioning our surroundings. We're always asking our parents why. Uh, when I was younger, I used to be quite inquisitive. And only a few days ago, my dad told me I was quite irritating <laughs> because of it. And it did hurt, but it goes to show the desire to question is an intrinsic part of human nature. But what's great about doing these research projects is we don't have to. No one's expecting us to do it. We're doing it because we're interested in it. We're doing it because we want to. We're not forced to do it like certain subjects or certain exams in school. We're not told you have to do this or you have to do that. We're doing it because we want to. And in a way, we're contributing to society. But what's, what's great about it is we're breaking the boundaries we didn't even know were placed on us. But I mean, in the future, if you think about it anyway, we are the ones that are going to be developing the next generation of cancer treatments. And we are the ones that are going to be pioneering the next generation of modern robotics. So why not get interested and get involved with our interests, with our passions at an early age as teenagers, even younger? Because despite our age, 
we still have the capacity to ask these complex, these, these exciting and these important questions. But as students and as teenagers, I think it comes down to one simple factor, and that's as students, we, we feel that this is above our means. We think we can't do these things. We think that we'll face hurdles and we'll face obstacles that we can't overcome. And that's simply not true. I mean, yes, you will face hurdles and yes, you will face obstacles. But if it's something that inspires you and excites you enough, you will find a way to overcome it, no matter what limitations are, are put on you. So essentially, anyone they apply themselves can do this sort of thing. We just have to get over the mindset that we can't. And if us as students and anybody really can do that, the number of opportunities and possibilities that's open up and present themselves are going to be endless. Thank you. Wow, this guy. Christian, Lizzie, and Leander, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.